As educators, we navigate through countless challenges every day. And one of the most empowering things we can do is reframe those challenges as opportunities. I'm Julie Hassan, educational researcher and author of Pause, Ponder, and Persist in the Classroom, How Teachers Turn Challenges into Opportunities. In the first video in this series, we talked about the power of pausing. When we start to feel some escalating emotions that may not be helpful, taking a breath, taking a beat, taking a pause, changing the story that we're telling ourselves about what those emotions mean, changing the story that we're telling ourselves about the situation, which leads us into our next step in the three-step framework, pondering. Pondering is the heart of reframing. I wanted to start with an example. If we've known each other for a while, then you know that for the past almost decade, I've been talking to people about the teachers they remember, the teachers who made a lasting positive impact on their lives. And one of the people I talked to was a young man named Ethan. I met Ethan on a college campus where he was majoring in engineering. And he told me a story about his fourth grade teacher, Mr. Cribs. Ethan said he couldn't wait to get to fourth grade because that was the year they got to play on the big playground at recess, the one with the volleyball court. And he remembers the kids starting a volleyball game every day at recess. But the ones who were a little bigger and stronger and tougher would hit the ball as hard as they could and make it so the other side couldn't hit it back. Kids were getting hurt, kids were quitting the game, there was all kinds of conflict. So his teacher, Mr. Cribs, took the ball one day and Ethan expected, okay, that's it. <laughs> no more volleyball. Mr. Cribs has taken the ball. And instead, Mr. Cribs held the ball for a minute. He called everybody over and he said, I bet you 15 extra minutes of recess that you can't hit that volleyball back and forth across the net a hundred times. But here's the catch. Everybody has to touch the ball at least once. So the kids who really wanted to play volleyball started teaching each other how to play. They started hitting the ball so the other side could hit it back. They started teaching the kids who hadn't played before how to tap it with their fingertips and get it across. And he said they started counting loud every time the ball went across the net. One, two, three, four. Ethan told me they named it the infinite game because they wanted to see if they could keep that volleyball going forever. It became their favorite thing to do at recess. But here's the really important part of Ethan's story. He said, now that I'm in college and I'm an engineering student, I could focus on making the highest grade because this is a really tough major. But instead, I invite other students to be in a study group with me. We help each other, we support each other, we make sure that everybody's in the game. He said, I could have tried to dominate, but instead I decided to play the infinite game. I'll be a better engineer because Mr. Cribs taught me how to collaborate. It's a teachable moment that came out of a recess conflict. I don't know Mr. Cribs, but I think he's absolutely brilliant. And what he did was a brilliant example of reframing. Because you know when that conflict first started, he had to feel some things. Some frustration, certainly aggravation. I mean, he wanted a few minutes of peace at recess too, and instead he's dealing with this big issue. But he asked himself an important question. Maybe the most important question of reframing. What opportunities are hidden in this challenge? And in that challenge was the opportunity to teach kids about the power of collaboration. So when you face a challenge, are you stopping, practicing your pause, taking that deep breath, and then asking yourself, what opportunities are hidden in this challenge? Because reframing starts with asking ourselves some questions. Now sometimes when something goes down in the classroom or in the school, especially when it's started by a student's choice, we might make some assumptions. We might make some assumptions about that student's character or motivation, but those are not helpful. No one likes to be the topic of inaccurate assumptions. And if we make decisions based on assumptions and those assumptions aren't accurate, then it's not going to be a good decision. So we've got to ask ourselves some questions. What assumptions am I making? 
What stories am I telling myself about the situation? Push those aside and get curious. Do what Mr. Cribbs did. Ask yourself what opportunities are hidden in this challenge. But also, you might have to ask the other people involved a question or two. When I work with teachers in schools on the pause, ponder, and persist framework, and we get to pondering, I always give this example for practice. I say, as the teacher, you've taught a lesson and then given some clear directions for independent work. And from the back of the room, you hear a student make that teeth sucking sound. Now, if you are the parent of a teenager or you work with teenagers, you know the sound I'm talking about. So a student makes that sound and says, I'm not doing that. Okay, first you have to pause because I'm certain you feel some feelings, maybe disrespected, frustrated, a little angry. Then you have to question what you're telling yourself. Am I telling myself this student is disrespectful or lazy or unmotivated or disruptive or any number of things? And instead get really curious. What's really going on here with this student? What you may have to do is ask the student some questions because with good information, you can offer good support and make some good decisions. Now in this case, you're not going to ask the student a why question because why aren't you doing the work or why did you say that? Can make a student defensive and make things worse. Instead, you're gonna ask some how or what questions. How can I help you get started? What's got you stuck? Am I making it safe and engaging with that student? You might just find some helpful information. Maybe the student doesn't have the prerequisite skills and is afraid to even begin. Maybe the student wasn't really listening or processing the directions. Anyway, you can move on in a productive way with that student. You can continue teaching and you can strengthen that relationship. Authors and organizational researchers, Peter and Edgar Schein, read a book called Humble Inquiry. And the premise is this, as leaders or as teachers who are leaders in a classroom, we have to know what we don't know. And asking questions and becoming curious is a humble act. It acknowledges that the people we're working with know things that we need to know in order to teach them or lead them. I think this second step in the pause, ponder, and persist framework, this pondering, is humble inquiry. It's knowing that we don't know all the answers. It's knowing that the initial narrative we create or the assumptions that may come to mind first are probably not the most helpful. It's getting curious, spending some time digging in to figure out what's really going on so we can make some choices that are helpful. Helpful to the students, helpful to our colleagues, helpful to us. Next time you're faced with a challenge, and you will be, every day as a teacher or leader, see if you can practice reframing that challenge by pausing and then pondering. Even if it's something as simple as the copy machine breaking on the day you are going to give a big assessment. Instead of feeling like the whole day is ruined, now you've got to change your plans, now you're going to be off for the whole week on what you would hope to accomplish, how can you reframe that? Maybe not being able to copy the assessment that day will give you some time to do some extra review that your students need. Maybe they can take the assessment in the computer lab that will mirror better the end of the year exam anyway. How can you reframe even those small challenges as opportunities to make an impact? Your students will be better for your doing that and you'll feel better too. In the next video, we're going to talk about persisting pausing and pondering our practices. They require time and attention and a great deal of persistence. Friends, if you enjoyed the Pause, Ponder, and Persist book, I'd love it if you would go to your favorite bookseller or book review site and leave a rating. You don't even have to write a review. Just click some stars. It will help other readers find the book. And if the Pause, Ponder, and Persist framework is helpful to you, if you enjoyed this video, please share it with another educator. I'd love to help as many educators as possible. I'll see you in the next video when we talk about the power of persisting.